Shalom and praise the Lord. Welcome everyone to our last class. Today's our last class. Thank you, Lucy and uh, uh, Sanjay and Daniel for um, joining class. Uh, we'll begin with a word of prayer. So I'll ask one of you to lead us in prayer, please. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord. Thank you for this day and this dear life. Thank you for your blessings, Holy Spirit, my Father. I submit for your hands, each and every one, and especially your soul and hands We will do with us through our lives. Thank you, Father. You will do with us through your words and give you understanding power and knowledge and give your uh, patience and uh, our soul for hands, each and every one. Give your conscience, Holy Spirit, my Father, and thank you for this, that last day for your giving us. Your enjoyment and thank you for this class uh, from the beginning and until the last class today. I send for hands. Thank you for blessing of Spirit, my Father. Thank you for your blessing and your guidance till the today last class. And I should send for hands and ask you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Okay, so today uh, we're just going to look at the last two chapters in uh, our book, Code of Honor. Okay, uh, what are some of the challenges or main challenges that uh, we face in ministry? As uh, people in ministry, ministers of God, leaders, pastors, what do you think are the main challenges we can face? Money, yes, money is one of the main challenges which can bring our downfall. What are the other things? Online students, what are the main challenges that can we face in ministry? What are some of the uh, things that can bring our downfall? Um, students said money here, and yes, money can bring our downfall. Yes, what else? What else? Women, yes. That's another main challenge that we can face. For we women, it can be men. Okay, what else? Fame, position, power. Yes, Sanjay says pride. Yes, so all of these are challenges that we can face in ministry. Okay, so we looked at one main challenge that was money, um, the last class. Today we look at another challenge, two more challenges that we can face. One is women. Okay, so this uh, book is basically written in the, uh, in the, in the context, on the framework that pastors writing basically to uh, men who are in ministry, but there are also women who are in ministry. So women uh, in the class don't think, okay, this lesson is not for me. This lesson is even for us, even we can apply this uh, for our own lives, okay? So because we also face a challenge of uh, falling into, um, you know, into sin with another man, okay? Even committing adultery if you're married. So uh, this, even though this lesson is, um, you know, titled as women, in, uh, you know, but even for us women, we can face the challenge of um, you know having a, a, a relationship with a man which can bring our downfall okay so these are some of the challenges that we face you know irrespective of how anointed we are gifted we are you know how powerfully god is using us you know how famous we are you know whether how prayerful we are uh, whether we are from the city whether we are from the village you know whatever area calling of ministry we will go through temptations we will face challenges okay so how do we overcome those uh, temptations how do we overcome those uh, challenges when we look at the bible who was uh, who's an example of a person you know who fell uh, for women and lost his anointing samson yes you know uh, samson thank you angeline uh, samson he was um, was he anointed by god Yes, and who is Samson actually? He's a judge, okay, and he's a leader. Why did God choose him? Give him the mic, please. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. 
lead the Israelis against the Philistines. Okay, to lead the Israelites uh, against the Philistines. Thank you, Andrew and Angeline. Um, he also was a Nazarite. Okay, so he has a Nazarite vow. What is a Nazarite vow? They have to be separate, okay, not touch anything that's unholy. What else? Not drink wine, not touch any uh, dead thing, right? Okay, and his anointing was and his strength was in his hair, okay? And uh, we see that he, even though he was called by God and he had this mighty anointing and this strength, what was his weakness? Women, right? And uh, he lost his strength, his anointing, because... He, he told what was his anointing to whom? To Delilah, yes, and she cut, had her hair cut off and he lost his strength, okay? Now, when you look at um, uh, Samson, was his um, downfall just in one moment or in one week or what do you think? It was over a period of? Time, yes, it was an over a period of uh, time, okay, and uh, he played with his anointing, right? He took it for granted, he did not value his anointing, his calling. Uh, who else did not value their Saul? Yes, who else? Somebody who did not uh, uh, value their birthright. Esau, Esau, yes, Esau sold his birthright to his uh, brother just for a bowl of soup, okay? So we see that, uh, yeah, thank you, Andrew, uh, Saul as well. So we see that he compromised, okay? And uh, sometimes we can, we can also come to that place where we, are, we feel greatly anointed, called by God, going, doing ministry, you know, and uh, we can play with our anointing or we can take things for granted, sin for granted, okay? And we think that, okay, God, I think Samson, he thought, you know, anyway, he's playing with women, he's enjoying himself and nothing has happened. He took it too far away. But then he, he did not realize that, you know, uh, he could lose his anointing and God was very patient with him, okay? And in the end, we see what happened, you know, it did not happen just overnight, but it happened over a period of time. So, you know, we need, uh, when God gives us a chance over a period of time, we need to check ourselves. We need to check our lives. Every day, I think we need to check our lives to see, you know, the areas of our weaknesses, our frailties, uh, you know, uh, sins that we are indulging in. We need to keep a tab of that. We need to guard our heart, guard our minds, and ask the Holy Spirit to cleanse us and to point the finger at the areas where he needs us to um, change. And so we see Samson was so blinded, and ultimately he lost his own um, his strength, okay? So how does this, uh, this whole thing of temptation against women come? It just comes with a small thought that Satan plants in our mind, okay? And what does a thought become? What does a thought become? Once we embrace that thought or once we receive that thought or we think about that, what is what does it happen? It can just be like, you know, you're flirting with somebody. You know, you're just thinking, oh, these are sisters, but you're just talking, flirting with them, commenting about their looks, commenting about their style, their, you know, just keeping on staring, looking at them, looking at pictures, uh, you know, women, uh, billboard signs, magazines. And, you know, these are things that, when our, it's our area of weakness, what can Satan do? He can just put a small thought, he can put a small suggestion. And what does a thought and suggestion become? Becomes more stronger and stronger. And once it becomes very stronger, it becomes like an argument, a reason. Okay? It becomes something like very convincing. You can argue against it. It's okay. You know, I'm just... I'm just joking with the, the ladies. I'm just talking. There's nothing wrong in that. I'm just looking at those pictures. I'm not going to go and commit any sin or I'm not going to go sleep with them or I'm not going to do anything that is going to harm them. But so those things are taking things to a, 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 le a level. It's becoming more stronger. But what happens when Satan puts a thought in your mind? What should you do? What should you do? When he puts an idea, so Sanjay says it grows like a weed or a cell of cancer. Yes, 
cancer cell can just be one or two and then it multiplies, right? It can also become an idea which Satan puts in our mind, okay? And it can, uh, we can be very convinced, we can reason, we can argue. I'm just talking to her. She's like my sister. You know, I'm just looking at these pictures. I'm just having some fun. There's nothing wrong in having fun. I'm not going to do anything to them, right? So those are kind of reasons and convincing thoughts and, uh, you know, uh, uh, mindsets that we can sun and we begin to argue those things. And those thoughts, imagine, imaginations, reasoning, you know, takes us captive. It becomes a stronghold, which becomes very difficult to break down. It becomes like, you know, fort. You've seen a fort? What do you say in Hindi for fort? Kila, yes. You know, why do kings build forts around the city? Because it becomes very difficult for the enemy to enter, right? So even our thoughts can become like a fort where you can sin, you can do wrong. And I've seen many people committing adultery, you know, even though they're married, um, having multiple relationships with women, and they think it's not wrong. Why? Because it becomes a reason, an argument in their mind. And, you know, they're convinced that this is okay. And that is sin, that is wrong. Okay? And we can replace the truth by the lies. And our enemy is a father of lies. That means he's the author, he's the he's greatest uh, liar, and he can put these lies in your mind. Okay? So what we need to do, you need to, uh, Lucy says, we need to bring every thought captive, um, you know, and Andrew says, we need to resist, we need to flee, as Paul says, you know, we need to resist and flee the enemy, just like Joseph did, okay, uh, when he fleed and he ran away. What is the meaning of flee? Joseph, <laughs> one student is just doing this action, you know. Yeah, I think you just have to leave everything and just run. Like I used to say, I say there's fire in this building, what will you do? You won't bother about your book, your Bible, your laptop, your mobile, you will just your friends or whoever, you just run from this uh, uh, basement, right? The same way you need to, you know, flee these thoughts. You need to bring th every thought captive. We look at it more in um, detail, okay? Uh, we need to be careful what our eyes are seeing. Okay, I like this uh, su uh, subheading here. It says, be careful little eyes how you see. Now, when I was in Sunday school, in the kindergarten, we learned this uh, song. Anyone remember the song, Be Careful Little Eyes How You See? Be careful little eyes how you see. Be careful little eyes how you see. For the Father up above is looking down in love. Oh, be careful little eyes how you see. Okay, so it's not only when we are small, but I think even when you grow up, you need to be so careful what we are see okay is it wrong to look at beautiful women is it wrong to admire handsome men for we women is it wrong to you know uh, admire and appreciate beauty in others what do you think men do you think it's wrong or a sin to look at beautiful women to admire their beauty only one is saying no very confidently the others what about the others lucy says once is okay no turning back <laughs> yeah, no turning back, no turning back through. Yes. Okay. Yeah, once is okay. I mean, it's okay to admire beauty. You, you look at somebody beautiful, you look at a beautiful woman, tall, beautiful, short, whatever, you know, smart, um, creative. And for us men, and for us women, it's okay to admire handsome men. There's nothing wrong. But like Lucy says, you don't have to take the second look. Okay, the second look or the second glance is what is very, very dangerous. Okay, so even when we are driving or we are walking on the street or when you're looking at the newspaper or some magazine, suddenly you will see a woman or a man just poorly dressed. Okay, or when you are Googling something, you'll find some images popping up. Uh, you can't do anything when it pops up. But what do you do? You don't give it a second look. You don't look in that direction. Okay, why don't you look in the, give it a second look? Why do you take away, why should you take away your eyes from it? What happens if you keep on concentrating and looking at it? What happens? If you keep on looking, it's temptation. There's a desire, right? You begin to admire it, you begin to appreciate it. Sanjay says we need to mature about youthful passions 
and look at people through the lens of scripture, they're not of this world, yes. Um, I don't think it's only youth who have lustful passions. I think even men, when they grow beyond 40, 50, 60, even men with 50, 60 can have as youthful passions, those cravings can come back even when they are 40, 50, and um, 60. Okay, so you need to take your eye away. Thank you, Lucy and Sanjay. Uh, take your eyes away. Don't let your mind wander away. Okay, why should you not let your mind wander away? Because what can happen if you keep looking at it, giving a second look? What will happen? Huh? Temptation. Lustful thoughts can come into your mind, right? You know why Satan puts only one thought? You know why Satan puts only one thought in your mind? One thought is enough. Yes, one thought is enough. And then, you know, like, you know, picture baki hai, like that. You know, this the full picture we can create for ourselves. We can create a movie in itself, okay? We can have, we can go through all those uh, things in imaginations in our mind right it's very very important that we need to take our eyes away because that can lead to uh, imaginations and even and lustful thoughts you know it becomes lustful thoughts because we our thoughts become our thoughts become our imaginations our ideas our imaginations ideas become our actions okay actions become your character and character is who you are okay so it's so important for us to not give that second look okay uh, not let our mind wander off not have lustful thoughts because um yes it's not a sin to admire a beauty and appreciate beauty but don't make that as an excuse because you can fall into lust then when you fall into lust you have all of these lustful thoughts and then you become have a desire to possess you want to have it, it your thoughts become your imaginations, ideas, ideas, imaginations become your actions. It goes into actions and that is when you fall into um, sin, okay? So the moment you get lustful thoughts or the moment we have all of these in our minds, what should we do? What action should we take? What are some of the practical things that we do? Do we all have, do we all have lustful thoughts in our minds sometimes? Yes, we do, right? Whether it's a man or woman. What do we do at those times? What should we do at those times? Sorry? Rebuke it, okay? Rebuke it in the name of Jesus. What else can we do? What are some of the practical things that we can do? You can think about other things. Maybe you're just sitting or you're lying down, you're not sleeping and, you know, you're having all these lustful thoughts in your mind. What should you do? Just get up and engage in some activity. Divide, the, divert your mind to something else. What else can you do? Speak in tongues, pray in tongues. Yes, that really helps. Another thing we can do is, you know, just... Uh, speak Bible verses, okay? So that is what I do when, you know, sometimes I just have lustful thoughts. I used to do these things, just pray in tongues, uh, just, uh, I, I, I learn scripture passages, uh, you know, in a week. So I, I remember all of those scripture passages. I run that through my mind, okay? Uh, and I remember some message or listen to some message or I divert my mind to something else. And these are practical things that we need to do. Okay, we just can't enjoy it and just in those lustful thoughts because that can be very, very harmful and dangerous for us. Okay, some of the things that scripture teaches us that we need to do uh, is, you know, there are some uh, verses here. If you look at, uh, look at your books, Job chapter 31, verse 1, um, Psalms chapter 101, verse 3, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 22. We can all memorize this scripture passages so that we can speak it when we go to have lustful thoughts. Lucy says you need to put on your spiritual armor. Yes. Um, and Sanjay says the entertainment industry today uses lust to make money. Social media follows the same principles and these are also the schemes of the enemy since we live in a fallen world. Yes. I think to avoid lustful thoughts, 
the main thing you can do is, you know, keep away as much as possible from social media. Like, you know, you can listen to messages, you can look at, you can listen to worship songs, but keep away from all of these movies and, you know, um, what else? Serials and all of those things that can, you know, put these lustful thoughts in our um, minds. Okay. Another thing that scripture teaches us is when Paul writes to Timothy, uh, you know, from prison, he's telling young Timothy because Timothy is very young. So it says, and he's a leader of the churches at Ephesus. So Paul tells Timothy, treat younger women as sisters with all purity. Okay. So he tells him, uh, look at First Timothy chapter 5, verse 1 and 2. Can somebody read that, please? First Timothy chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. First. Oh. Is there in your book? Okay. First Timothy chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. Uh, First Timothy chapter 5, verse 1. Do not rebuke an older woman, older man, but exhort, uh, exhort him as a father. Younger men as brothers. Verse 2, older women as mother, younger women as sisters, with all purity. Yeah, so he says that treat older women, mothers, and younger women as sisters with all purity. Okay, so as people in ministry, we will have men and women who come to us, you know, for prayer. Uh, they'll share their problems, they'll come for encouragement, they'll come for counsel. And what do we do at those times? We need to help them out, but we need to guard our hearts, okay? We need to um, guard our thoughts and keep our emotions uh, pure, okay? Um, and if you sense that you are suddenly getting an emotional attachment with a man or a woman who's coming to you for counseling, for prayer, what should you do? When you are counseling, praying for somebody, helping them through a problem, whether it's women for men or uh, for... Uh, you know, uh, for us, uh, you know, for us women, if it's men who come to us for help, or for you men who come, women come, you know, you think you feel the need to help them out. What should you do? Don't say that, you know, okay, this woman is older to me, okay? Only we fall in young uh, love with people who are younger. Is it possible for us to fall with women who are older? Yes, it is. So what should you do at those times? How can you guard your heart? How can you keep a check on your emotions? Uh, we can tell uh, any woman from our church to help that uh, woman. Yes, you can tell another woman who is mature in your church to help this woman. Maybe listen to the problem, pray for that person, but maybe the second or the third, when the second time, the third time the person comes back to you, divert them to an, your wife if you're married, or if, your hus if you're married, your husband, you know, or to some older women in your church who can really um, help them, okay? So that's very, very important. So that's how we can guard ourselves and protect ourselves and take a step back, okay? So uh, should, we, should we preach and teach and pray and impart to women and men? Yes or no? Yes, we should, okay? But at the same time, you know, uh, when you're handling issues with uh, men or women, we need to handle it with wisdom, okay? If you find yourself spending a lot of time with a woman, uh, mentoring her, helping her through her problem, there's high probability that you can uh, get emotionally attached. Even if you're not emotionally attached, the other person can get emotionally attached too you because you know we're all looking for love affection and here there's somebody and that person is craving for love and affection they're not having it they're going through a problem so they're coming to you and you are listening to them you're giving time to them you are helping them out it can create this emotional bond attachment and you know um, before you know it uh, you know you can get into a relationship with that person and it can end up in in, in sexual sin so what you need to do is you know um, be aware of it, guard it, don't think, hey, I'm very strong, I'm very, you know, confident, uh, this woman, this man cannot sway me, cannot lead me astray, you know, I have a strong will, I'm very prayerful, all that is fine, but we need to also guard our hearts, we need to also keep our boundaries in tact, okay? I remember when I was uh, in school, uh, we were playing this uh, game, you know, um, uh, 
um, uh, where we had two groups in our class. One was uh, sheep and the other was wolves or lion. And the sheep had to make a, a, a circle like a sheep pen and the, in the center there was a sheep and the wolf or the lion from the other group had to come and catch the sheep in the center. So as long as you are in that sheep pen, that uh, your group that is protecting you, you know, they'll hold hands and they won't let the wolf or the, you know, or the lion come in. I remember, you know, I once stepped out of that boundary. Okay, I still remember I stepped on the boundary and I thought, hey, I'm a good athlete. I was a very good athlete, a good runner in school. So I thought, you know, I'll run around the field and I'll come back into my circle. And I stepped out of that boundary. And when I stepped out, I thought I can run fast. But the other person, the wolf or the lion, came and caught me and I got out. And everybody in my group saying, why did you step out of that boundary? You know, that was a good learning for me. You know, the moment you step out of your boundary, the moment you do things that you know is not right, you, you, you're you overconfident, that can be your downfall. And Satan can use that against you. So be within your boundaries. Keep Think about the boundaries you want to place in your life. Very important. Don't fall into temptation and then think, oh my gosh, I shouldn't have done this. Next time I'll not do it. It can be too late. There are consequences that you will face. So now itself, it's good to think about what are the boundaries you want to keep in life. Okay. Recently, I know I stepped out of my boundary. Okay. In one area of my life, I stepped out of my boundary and I faced the consequences of it. And I realized, oh my gosh, I, so unconsciously I did it. Stepped out of my boundary and look at the mess I am in. And it, 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 uh, you know, it affects you so much. So it's very important that you know your boundaries and keep within your um, boundaries. So um, Paul, even writing to Titus, another young man, uh, you know, look at what he says in Titus chapter 2, verses 3 to 5. Can somebody else read it, please? Titus chapter 2, verses 3 to 5. Read, read. You can go ahead and read. Yeah. Titus chapter 2, verse 3. The older woman, likewise, that they be reverent in behavior, not, uh, not slenders, not given too much wine, teachers of good things. Verse 4, that they uh, admonish the young women to love their husbands, to love their children. Verse 5, to be discreet, uh, just, homesick, homemaker, good obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be blasphemed. Yes. Thank you. So here uh, Paul is telling Titus, Titus, you know, he knows he's a young man. So he's telling him, Titus, when you want to deal with women, let older women deal with the younger women. Okay, let them mentor them, let them uh, teach them. Okay. Now, if you are a pastor, a ministry leader, and you have men, suppose you're a, a woman as a, a pastor and a ministry leader, or there are men who's a pastor or leader, you know, you have women and or men in your team. How will you handle them? How should your behavior be towards them? What are the things you should do? What should you do? Come on, men and women. What should you do when you have, you're a, you're a leader as a man, what should you do when you have women in your team? Or as women, what should we do if we have men in our team? OK, first. Uh, Sanjay says, 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 1 and 2 says, uh, you know, uh, treat them like mothers, treat them like sisters. Okay. Uh, what else? What else should we do? Should you acknowledge and honor them? Yes. Should you lead them? Yes, you should lead them and guide them. Okay, um, uh, and that uh, when when they want emotional support, they want companionship. Should you give them emotional support and companionship? No, don't give them emotional support and companionship. Let other women in the team do it. Okay, but you just give them guidance. Uh, you acknowledge them. You honor them. Okay, instruct them. Uh, but when it comes to uh, work or ministry related things you can instruct a woman what if a, and a man okay what if they're married can you instruct them in all other areas of their life how they treat their husbands how they take care of their home where they should live 
what they should do, which school they should put their children in. No, why? No. Why shouldn't you do it? Because there are, those are areas where they have to deal it with their spouse. Okay? It's their husband who will oversee the family matters, the house matters. Okay? So, you know, the husband is the head. You are not the head of that woman. And, uh, you know, as women, we are not the head of men. Okay? So don't try to step into those areas that is under the husband's purview or jurisdiction. Okay, you just give them area of, uh, uh, you just handle the areas of their ministry, wherever it's related to you and them in the ministry, in the workplace, give them instructions and guidance. Other areas, they are responsible to their spouse. Okay, don't step into their family matters. Okay, otherwise, what happens to women or the man? They'll be confused, right? Who to listen to. But if they come to you for advice, you know, then you can give them advice but you know the scripture says wives submit to your own husbands as to the lord ephesians 5 22 okay so it's important that we don't step into those areas and those boundaries if they're not married still those areas we don't step into because they're under their parents okay their parents make decisions over uh, certain aspects and areas of their life don't step into those areas unless they come to you for help Okay, should we treat uh, women equally to men if they are in our team? Yes, okay, because God has given all men and women the same gifts. Okay, the gifts, God's gifts, grace, blessings, empowering are given both to men and women equally. Okay, thank you, Deepu and Sanjay, for your answers. Um, so, we need to provide equal opportunities for both men and women at the same time we need to recognize their strengths and weaknesses okay um what do you think when it comes to uh, uh, giving them opportunities we should we give them equal opportunities like men yes or no okay there are some areas where they can't but most areas they can give them equal opportunities to serve to lead to carry responsibilities and so on but do we expect the same standards of conduct and accountability just like a, a, a woman and a man what do you think you can't expect what about accountability and conduct suppose you have women and men in your team should you expect the same accountability for in both areas of conduct and, uh, and uh, accountability for men and women? Yes, there should be conduct. A good what is conduct? The way you behave. Okay, you can't expect oh she's a woman so we can't tell her anything. Let her behave however childish. No. Okay, accountability. You say okay. We we tell the man what do you have you done? Give me. Should you ask that for a woman as well who's in your team? Who's yes. So conduct and accountability, we can and also give same opportunities. But be gentle when you're treating women, okay? And recognize that both have their own strengths and weakness, okay? Okay. Um, we also know that, you know, uh, what, are our okay, what are our common emotional needs? As human beings, what is our common emotional needs? You know, what are your emotional needs as human beings? Trust, okay. Nobody here needs love. <laughs> what else? Okay, thank you. One person raised up their hand. What else? Love, trust, care, yes. You want people care for you. What else? Expectation, okay. Huh? Concern, show you concern, care and concern, time, yes. Respect, thank you. Um, so some answers here from our online students. Uh, Deepu says love and support. Angeline says to be cared for. Sanjay said respect, yes. Lucy says love, patience and affection. Angeline says time, yes. We need all of these uh, things, appreciation admiration you know you need companionship 
You know, that's why you get married, you have friends, okay, you need trust, you need people to converse with you. Now, what happens when these emotional needs are not met? It's not fulfilled in you. What happens? Hello? What happens when emotional needs are not met? It's unfulfilled. What happens? You get discouraged, yes? What will you do? You get disappointed, okay? You will look for it wherever you can get it, right? And whoever is giving it to you, what happens? Whoever is filling that need, meeting that need, you get attracted to them, you get connected to them, you get attached to uh, them, okay? So uh, we can have people like this in our church, in our ministry team, in our um, uh, in our offices, in our workplace, in uh, even if you're running an organization or as a pastor, you can have people who have unmet emotional needs. So you need to be very, very careful and you need to have some boundaries that you put in place. So what are some of the boundaries that we can put in place for ourselves? What can offense that we can put? What are some of the boundaries that we can have for ourselves? For me, I'll tell you some of my boundaries that I have. I don't uh, talk, uh, you know, when I uh, when somebody, a man comes to me with a problem, just once or twice, and after that, if they keep coming, I'll connect them with somebody else. I don't engage in too much of talking and conversation and joking uh, with another man. Even, you know, if my colleagues, I keep distance. Uh, one, you know, just talk very minimal, not too much. No, I don't uh, touch. I don't uh, shake hands. I don't, you know, give a hug or do, don't put my hand on the shoulder. Even for when I was ministering to children, I never used to do it for children above grade six and above. Okay, I just keep my distance. I just say, I just pat them on their back or their shoulders and say, good job, but never used to, uh, you know, um, son, with, with girls and ladies, I'm fine, but not with um, men. Yes, I avoid private meetings. If I have to talk with a man or woman, I talk in public where everybody's there, um, not meeting personally, not going uh, any place. So what are some of the boundaries you all can put? Some of the boundaries, you all don't have boundaries, that means. Hello, no boundaries? Dangerous? Please have some boundaries. Okay, so some of the things Pastor says he does is he avoids complimenting ladies for their looks. Okay, um, he avoids uh, complimenting ladies for the way they look, the way they dress. Uh, he does not engage in too much of a conversation, talking too much with a woman, okay? Yes, avoid phone calls in the night. Uh, that is another important thing. Thank you, thank you, Daniel. Not only during the nights, I avoid phone calls even during the uh, daytime. With a man, just keep it minimal. Hello, yes, what is the thing, issue, problem, we'll talk about it. If it's going to go beyond, I'll say we'll talk about it uh, later when we meet in person, okay? Uh, Andrew says, yeah, touching, Deepu says touching, Andrew says to keep things which are spiritual, spiritual, sorry, keep things which are spiritual to be done other than the spirituality, no flesh moves. Okay, um, keep things that are spiritual, spiritual, and don't let the flesh come and be a hindrance, okay? And also, pastor avoids uh, to try to be a close companion or a emotional support for a lady okay uh, if you go to pastor and you're very disappointed and you're sharing with him and you're crying he'll just listen uh, but later on he will put you on to somebody else to um, help you okay so there's important things that we need to keep these guards these fences so that it can protect us so you have us uh, uh, your personal self-defense plan okay uh, so some of the personal self-defense plan that person, a pastor has uh, is, um, Daniel also says, don't have individual meetings with women, yes. Uh, some of the personal defense plans that pastor has put in his life, which can help you all as well, is he says when he prays for a lady, uh, when he, he feels that he needs to lay hands, he just lay hands on their head. 
if uh, he wants them, is, if they're having a problem with any other part of their body, he will ask them to lay hand on that part of their body and he will just pray for uh, them. Uh, he just counsels a woman once or twice, then he puts them on to somebody else. If he needs to meet an, a woman individually, he does it in the place where every there are many people, there's a crowd, you know, uh, and he also keeps healthy distance uh, with women. He doesn't just, you know, have casual, friendly conversations with ladies. I think that's very important, you know. Um, I too don't have just friendly, gen convers casual conversations with men. Just keep it very... Oh, sorry. So when did it go? I muted it. Just one minute. Okay. So this is some of the self-defense plan that uh, Pastor has put in place, which is here in this book. So you can um, you can keep um, um, you know you can have your own self-defense plan. I think it's very very important. Okay. Uh, the Bible also talks about uh, holy kiss. Okay. If you look at Romans chapter 16 was 16. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 16 was 20. Can somebody read that, please? Just two references. Romans 16, 16. Romans 16, uh, verses 16. Read one another with a holy kiss. The churches of uh, Christ will be you. First Corinthians 16, verses 20. All the brethren greet you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. Okay, thank you. So, uh, do we have this holy kiss uh, in in your churches? Do you have it? We don't have that at APC. What about your churches? In person students? Online students, do you have something called a holy kiss? Where you go around just hugging and kissing the members in your uh, church or your team? Okay, so most of them are saying no. Okay, this was the kind of a culture in those days. Okay, some churches, they still do have this culture, but this culture no longer prevails. It was basically a holy case. It was just a sign of peace, friendship, and brotherly love. Uh, but I don't think it's done anymore, not because it was abused, but because the congregation was growing. In those days, in Paul's time, uh, in the early church, they all did not have churches as buildings. They met in house churches. So very few of them met. So they used to, uh, you know, kiss each other. But we don't do this uh, nowadays. Um, uh, and if, even if it's done, it can be abused. And it's not also part of our culture, so we don't do it. And some cultures, they still follow it. Um, even if they follow it, it's not abused, OK? Uh, but we don't practice this holy uh, kiss thing here at APC, okay? And a um, few more points that we can keep in mind is, you know, um, when we need to be on our guard at two moments in our life, okay? When are the two moments in our life when we need to put on extra guard or be, you know, put keep that guard strong in just two very important moments of our lives, in our lives? It comes at different phases, but what do you think are these two moments when we need to keep our guard up and really strong? Any ideas? Huh? In anger, okay. Think about Bible, Samson. When was his guard the lowest and the weakest and he lost? Huh? Okay. When was he in love with so many women and all of those things? When he was actually winning all the battles, right? Yes. He was having victory, he was having battle, he was winning battle after battle, he was defeating his enemies, and, uh, you know, he was just being so powerful. Everything was going so 
well. So at times of great confidence, you know, that time it can be our weakest moments. Because those times also we can think, hey, we are so fruitful in ministry, everything is going well, we can tend to relax, take it casually, take it lightly, and that's when we can get into sin. When did David sin against Bathsheba? Do you remember? Sanjay says when victory or defeat. Yes, thank you, Sanjay. When did um, uh, David sin against Delilah? Uh, sorry, Bathsheba. Sorry. Okay, but what time was it? What season was it? Huh? Victory season. There was battle, right? There was a battle going on. Instead of being in the battlefield, he was here. He was winning the battle. He was just relaxing. And what happened when he was a time of relaxing? You know, he he fell into uh, temptation. So times when you know when you have uh, great your great levels of ministry, things are going well. Your conference went well. Your uh, uh, programs went well, and you're really rejoicing. God has um, you know brought you to a place where there's so many members in your church. Your church is flourishing. Those times can be the weakest times in your in your life when you can fall into sin and temptation. If you look, study uh, men and women of God when they fell, it was these times when there was times of great revival, great move of God, you know, uh, great times of uh, uh, a breakthrough, and all of those times are times when you know they are relaxed, and that's when Satan can you know uh, take hold of them because their guard and their defenses are. Uh, down okay so Sanjay says in time of victory or defeat Sonia says during times of trouble yes uh, Andrew says war um, Angeline says battle yes even when we go through our weakest moments when we're losing when we're failing when we're emotionally weak you know when you're not your uh, your relationship with your spouse is not very good you're constantly fighting with your husband or your wife or this problem in your marriage or this problem between your parents or this problem in the workplace you know suddenly somebody comes and they're listening to you they're helping you they care showing love and affection the weakest moments can also be the weakest moments when we can drop our guard and that is why there is uh, so much of adultery that is happening in the workplace because men and women are working long hours, hardly get to see husband and wife, you know, and when they meet, they're just fighting. And then they go to office, there is this young lady, there is this nice man who's talking, caring for them, helping them out, listening to them, you know, wiping their tears, and they feel emotionally bonded. And that can be the weakest moments when we can lose and we can uh, fall into temptation. So those times we need to guard ourselves, we need to keep our guards up, and we need to always guard our uh, affections, okay? Uh, don't take confidence in the flesh, okay? Uh, the flesh is very faithful to do whose job? The flesh is faithful to do whose job? Satan's job, right? So even when Satan is not around, the flesh is very, very good to fall into temptation. Why? Because James chapter 1 verse 14 says that, you know, clearly tells us we are tempted when we are drawn away and led by our own desires. So uh, temptation is not when Satan comes and tempts us, but say, temptation is when we are led away by our own desires okay our own fleshly desires when we're drawn away it weakens our will and it leads us into temptation okay so the devil's job is just to put a small thought just to stir up that flesh that desire and the rest is done he goes and meddles with somebody else okay so temptations will come but we need to continuously keep on guard watch and pray so that you don't fall into temptation okay so how do you guard yourself so that you don't fall into temptation how do you guard your heart and your mind prayer fasting what else fear of god yes the word of god important read the word of god fill your mind with the word of god okay 
yes the knowledge of the word of god memorize the word of god the more you fill your mind and your heart with the word of god the more all of these uh, things uh, the fleshly desires the lust of the flesh will disappear okay and fight the good fight of faith and hold on to eternal life there's so much that you can lose for your eternal life and it's not worth losing a woman a man is not worth losing just a moment of pleasure is not worth losing like esau he just lost it for a bowl of soup and then he wanted it did he receive it back no okay so don't lose your soul it's not worth losing and sanjay says yes fellowship with like minded believers is very very important fellowship worship like minded people is very important okay uh, we'll end class here and we'll come back after the break and we'll just finish the last chapter and we'll get done with it thank you